Welcome to Recovery Monday with your host, J. Michael McCoy. All right, welcome Recovery Monday on this uh, sixth day of May in the Lord's Year 2013. I'm J. Michael McCoy on 99.3 KTIA and across the land from webcast1live.com. Uh, recovery Monday is a day when we bring guests in and they talk about recovery from hurts, habits, and hangups, alcoholism, drug abuse, things like that. Uh, and you may say, well, I, I don't have that problem, so I'm just going to push the button. No, 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 no. Don't push that button. You're going to hear something today that God wants you to hear. There's something within Jim's story that you're going to hear today that God wants you to put into your story. And you don't know what it is, and I don't know what it is, and Jim doesn't know what it is, but God knows what it is. It'll be that nugget of wisdom that he passes on his words through Jim's mouth. So listen today, if you would, and uh, maybe you'll find out something about yourself or maybe somebody in the family or a friend. Uh, Either way, there's something here for you today, and we appreciate you listening. My guest and co-host, well, my co-host on Mondays is going to be Lila Stafford. This is her first day here. Lila, welcome. You just have to talk right into that mic. Thank you. There you go. And you have to turn on the mic. They're on. Oh, okay. And uh, we thought we'd start out the first day and make it a family affair. And her husband, Jim, is here. And you have 23 years. 23 years. And you have more, right? Yes. 27 years. <laughs> is, is that a point of contention ever? Between? Not really. I admire uh, her uh, extra two years. She claims it's, no, an extra it's more four than two. Years. No, well, it's more than two years. Into- <laughs> it's more. But I, I am curious how that worked with, because uh, you guys were both, uh, uh, you enjoyed life. You enjoyed your social life. Uh, you enjoyed uh, weekends at the lake. And then you decided to quit drinking before Jim did. No, we both decided to quit at the same time, and he lied for four years. Well, That's where the contention is. I had is. a different understanding, man. <laughs> I think there's two different stories here is what I think there is. Yeah, well, let me tell you my story. All right, we'll be glad to Lila tell you. Lila can your... jump in uh, when she uh, hears anything that's inaccurate. That she needs to correct? Exactly. Um, uh, and, and here's what I need you to do at home. The phone lines will be open, one 855 244 0077 write that down Uh, i'll let you get a piece of paper and a pencil and i'll give it to you again in a minute but if you have any questions and if you want to call up and say i have this friend that's okay we don't mind that at all we won't we won't make fun of you we understand that these are dark secrets inside some families and they don't want to come out yet and we're perfectly understanding in that but if you do have questions about this friend or someone in your family, make sure that you call that number. Here it is again. Get a pencil and paper. one 855 And uh, uh, Father Tattoo is uh, producing today, and he'll be glad to answer that phone and, and get you on the air. So, Jim, uh, born and raised where? Here in Des Moines. Okay. And uh, my story starts uh, some 50 years ago. Uh, I really uh, uh, started drinking, I guess, when I was 14, 15 years old. Wow. And uh, we would just drink on the weekends and, uh, you know, just uh, a little beer on the weekends. No big deal. And uh, all my friends did it. Uh, It was no big thing at all. Um, My drinking progressed through high school. Well, I I ought to probably talk about my first drinking experience because I guess maybe normal people, um, if they'd had the first experience I had with drinking, they might have quit. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, my first experience was uh, a friend of mine uh, and I broke into his father's liquor cabinet, <laughs> and uh, we took a little bit of uh, every type of liquor and poured it into two 16-ounce bottles of Bubble Up. And I don't remember if you remember Bubble I Up. I do remember yeah. Bubble Up. And uh, we uh, went down to Whitmer Park, and uh, we both proceeded to drink our 16-ounce bottles of uh, mixed liquors. This was nasty. Terrible oh, I bet. Stuff. But uh, I was so proud of myself because uh, I was a man. I think I was 15 years old and uh, didn't, uh, didn't get sick. And my friend just immediately got sick and um, threw up over where, everywhere. And uh, I was uh, just embarrassed by his uh, behavior, you know. Sure. Uh, until uh, we went to a party that evening, uh, I vaguely remember. I really don't remember much until the next morning. And I woke up in my parents' bed. I knew that was not a good place to wake up, <laughs> and um, uh, I was told that um, that uh, my parents had come down to Broadlawn's Hospital, where the police had found me laying on a curb, I guess. Uh, my friends had started to take me home, 
couldn't uh, lift me and went to get reinforcements. In the meantime, the police came and took me to Broadlawn's Hospital. They pumped my stomach and uh, called my parents, and they came and got me, and I didn't wake up till the next morning. And um, you don't remember any of that? don't remember any of it. No, of course not. Wow. But what a – I mean, I do remember how uh, violently sick I was. Um, but nevertheless, within a matter of – after I was not grounded, I was probably grounded for a month or two, who knows, but – after being uh, ungrounded, I, uh, of course, went back to drinking beer on the weekends, and it was just terrible. I would get sick immediately upon drinking beer. And I guess most normal people would have probably said, you know, this is not a good situation. It might have quit. But um, I liked the effect that I got from drinking, and I liked the camaraderie. I liked uh, being part of uh, a group, and uh, my group drank. I mean, that's what we did. We did that all through high school, and um, I did that actually – uh, through college, and uh, it wasn't uh, until uh, after I was married and 21 years old, I was out with the boys and um, uh, was drinking a little bit, you know, on a Saturday afternoon and was uh, heading home and uh, got in a car wreck. Mm. And uh, they uh, uh, asked me if I'd been drinking, and the, an alcoholic, if he ever is asked if he's been drinking, the the usually say, no. had a couple. Oh, God, had a couple. A couple. You know, a couple dozen right. in my case. But um, uh, they told me back then, this was back in 1969, okay? And they told me, uh, just call your wife. You're not in any condition to, to drive. And um, if she comes to get you, we'll just let you go on uh, to her. Uh, but she was so angry that uh, she wouldn't come get me. <gasps> and uh, so they took me to jail, and they took my blood alcohol level, and I was legally drunk. And um, that was the first... Uh, uh, OWI offense that I ever received. Which back then would have been 0.16? Uh, probably, uh, yeah. It was very lenient. Yeah, very no, probably, liberal. No, probably uh, 0.10. Uh, 1.0, okay. Yeah, I mean, it was very um, tough to get drunk, but um, I was drunk nevertheless. And um, so, you know, I just figured that was a bad experience. Actually, I chalked it up to my wife not coming to get me. If she'd come and gotten sure. me, I wouldn't have been arrested right. for OWI and right. I wouldn't have wouldn't have had one of those on my record but uh, I continued to drink and uh, because that was just a, a piece of bad luck frankly um sure that, um, that first one and uh, continued to drink and um uh then kind of threw myself into my career and um, spent a lot of time in my career after graduating from uh, college and um, I was in advertising and marketing and uh gosh I couldn't have picked a, a better career for drinking uh, i don't know if uh, you ever watched mad men uh, but sure. that was kind of the tail end of those everybody had liquor in their offices and we drank openly and smoked openly and i mean it was just that's part of the culture went out for uh, three martini lunches and sometimes came back sometimes didn't you know? yeah it was just part of the culture so um i continued to drink um uh on weekends, typically. I didn't drink every day, uh, so I knew I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, alcoholics drink every day. They don't have responsible jobs. You know, they don't belong to the country club. They don't have two-car garage and, um, you know. This is what you thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. I figured. Yeah. That's yeah, the, we, they live under the bridge and have brown paper bags. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I – I, um, to make a long story short, my uh, first marriage uh, – ended when my wife didn't come home. I guess I was spending a little more time than I had thought on, on work and not being around. And so she found out, uh, found somebody that could be around a little more than I was evidently. So I went out to the bars, uh, and, um, uh, to, you know, uh, share how, um, bad I felt with everybody, shared it with the bartenders and, uh, was coming home one night. I had a babysitter too, because my wife had left me and, um, part of my thing was so that she wouldn't leave. I said, well, you can leave if you want, but uh, the kids are not negotiable. They're going to stay with me. Mm -hmm. She said, okay. Mm. So mm. now I'm, uh, I'm an alcoholic. I, I didn't admit that, but, uh, I'm drinking heavily. Uh, my wife had left me. And, um, so I went to the bar, uh, only to come back on kind of a, it was a, a bad night. Okay. It was snowing and, uh, kind of icy out and, I, I apparently must have fishtailed a little bit, and the uh, police stopped me. Mm. And if it hadn't been icy and snowy, I wouldn't have ever have fishtailed, and the police wouldn't have stopped me, and I wouldn't have got my second OWI. <laughs> you know? But again, it was just um, bad luck. 
It was just, uh, you know, a, a bad thing that happened to Jim again. Yeah. And uh, so, but it, it, the judge was pretty um, lenient. Uh, back then, this was, again, more than 25 years ago. Uh, they weren't nearly as tough on you as they were well, today. Well, no, it was longer than that. You, how old were you? Yeah, I was uh, 25? 35. Oh, 35. Thir- 32, okay. early 30s, okay. I guess, for the second time that I was. Yeah, but see, the nice thing about that is that there weren't any computers. Right. Uh, they didn't even know that I'd been picked up in 1969, and I didn't admit to it. Right. So they thought that was the first time that I'd ever been picked up. And they gave me what was called a suspended sentence or a deferred sentence. Right. If I stayed out of trouble for a year, then um, uh, it would go off my record. And so um, uh, I happened to uh, meet my, uh, my, what I call it, my current wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, your last my, wife. My last wife. Yes, your last wife. Wife number two. <laughs> number two. Uh, and one of the things that attracted me to Lila was um, she was a party girl. Mm-hmm. I mean, she liked to drink. And you're much younger than he is. No. No? No, well, no I'm a, I thought you were like 14 years younger. No. Oh, yeah. I look like it. No, um, I'm two years younger. Two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I'd known Lila uh, growing up. Um, one of my good friends, Lila, was um, the little sister of one of my good yeah. friends. And so it didn't take a lot of uh, time to get acquainted with Lila because I'd known her and her history and uh, her whole family history. And so actually uh, we had one date in high school, but you got drunk and I went, I went, we went to a kager else. together. You had to have a date <laughs> to go to this kager okay. and uh, it was out at the old, um, living history farms, which at that time it was in a conversion from the state prison farm, okay. uh, to, um, uh, it was privately owned at that time and then sold to living history farms. But this was when it was privately owned. There was a huge party out there. You had to have a, a date to go. So I took your buddy's little with, sister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No but back deal. to when we met, there is this saying: you you are attracted to the same level of dysfunction, <laughs> and this is where we were. We both loved to party. We drank the same thing, and and it, it's so embarrassing now to think of all the places we showed up drunk, thinking that everyone else was drunk. Oh, we did. And once you sober up, it's like, whoa, these people were not drunk. It was us. Yeah. It's it's really embarrassing to think about that. <laughs> it is a bit. Uh, but nevertheless, I was attracted to her because she was a party girl, and uh, within six months, uh, we were married. And uh, wow. uh, she decided she had been a teacher for 10 years. She decided she wanted to get her master's degree. We lived in Waterloo, and so she could go to UNI and get her master's. And uh, But uh, we also took on a foreign exchange student, and then we're raising two children uh, ages uh, six and so i mean it was just chaos yeah you know we lived in chaos and drama all the time what did you do in waterloo i was in advertising i was a partner in an advertising oh, okay. agency there also were you I've there been, in 78 i uh, was in uh yeah mm-hmm. i worked for i know you did oh okay yeah yeah i didn't know that yeah okay i, I worked for a radio station in waterloo during that time yeah and uh, i was in uh, advertising with an agency there and um uh, so uh, Lila and I got along. I mean, it was pretty hectic and pretty crazy. And uh, But immediately, I think, we started having marriage counseling uh, because we were arguing a bit. It seemed that our arguing uh, increased uh, in intensity with the amount that we drank, too. So I think we had decided we were going to taper off. And uh, no, I wasn't there. That was in Washington. We I decided I was leaving. No, but you were and counting you, my drinks in, in Waterloo at parties, so okay. I know we But at gonna, one point I said, um, I'm leaving, and then we decided to move to Washington. Yeah, we moved and to Washington. And then we lived on a lake, and if you know anything about lake people, mm-hmm. um, it was a party constant time. party there. Yeah. Everybody we ran around with drank. So it, and, then it, and then we decided, I decided, one of us had to grow up. Yeah. And so she quit. Yeah. All right, we're gonna we're gonna take a break there. This is uh, fascinating to hear these stories about how uh, people fall in love and they're attracted to the same type of people. What'd you say to the same level of dysfunction? Yeah, and uh, uh, we'll hear the rest of the story with Jim and Lila Stafford this afternoon on Recovery Monday. I'm Jay Michael McCoy, and if I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. I love this job. Couldn't do without you. Right here on Recovery Monday at WebcastOneLive.com. Brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm service legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. 
You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm gonna take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to Recovery Monday from The View from a Pew with your host, J. Michael McCoy. 21 minutes after the hour on the sixth day of May in the Lord's year 2013. Uh, welcome back to Recovery Monday. My uh, co-host on Mondays will be uh, Lila Stafford. Usually Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat, will be here, but he's... Uh, He's testifying today. Uh, you didn't get to meet this guy. I really wanted you to meet him. Bob um, is a neat guy, a, a very strong believer, but he is in charge of the DOT lab. Oh, neat. Uh, or not the DOT, the Iowa... Forensics. Is, yeah, forensics. Okay. And he I is one of the nation's um, experts on alcohol. Interesting. And so he will testify in different cases all over the country... Uh, on how the alcohol and the effects of alcohol and things like that. So he's seen it. Yeah. So and so it's really good to have him as a part of the show. That's so yeah. when we're talking yeah, about that, absolutely. So uh, Lila and Jim are here, and uh, Lila, by the way, is a uh, um, uh, an addiction counselor. Is that the right way yes. to call it? And so if uh, anything you hear today rings true, and you want to talk to her, um, call in at one eight five five two four four double o double seven. If you want to talk to her off air. Just tell Father Tattoo that you want to uh, give him uh, uh, Lila's phone number, and we'll pass that to Lila, and you can talk to her afterwards. And I suppose the same thing's true for you. Absolutely, man. If you want to talk to you. Yeah. All right, so um, you're 31, 32, uh, getting a divorce or divorced at this time, second OWI, but it doesn't phase you, does it? Not at all. I found a gal that uh, liked to drink with me, liked to party with me, and we did. Uh, we decided that um, maybe our relationship would improve if we quit our drinking. So we made a solemn oath uh, that we would quit drinking. And uh, she did. 
Um, I just couldn't string together anything more than about 30 to 60 days mm. without just feeling terribly anxious. And my job took me on a lot of traveling. And uh, of course, there was a lot of drinking at that time. And so I made up my mind that I just wouldn't drink around Lila. Sure. And uh, so um, I was really living a lie. And and, but why didn't that work? Why wouldn't that work, Lila? Well, because well, I had told her that I'd quit drinking. So oh, I was lying. Oh, and oh. so and she I didn't think angry. I was drinking. The reason I stayed clean was I was so angry at you. We, yeah. were, we were in Florida on a vacation. And one of his children was um, throwing some food up in the air at a nice restaurant and then catching it with his mouth and eating it. And I, I put my, <laughs> my hand, kind of kid. yeah. Well, I put my hand on his leg and I said, "We don't do that at nice restaurants." And, and then Jim I went was crazy drunk, and blew up and stood up on the, table. on the table and called her names, <sighs> called me horrible names, yeah, and I, I had, walked out and yeah, I was going to leave him. It was yeah. like I've had it. And so I was going to leave, and then I get outside, and we're on an island, and I couldn't get off the island. Yeah. So I came back, and I thought, I'm getting divorced. I'm leaving him. And he, you were on a, um, you had to leave Florida and go on a um, business trip. Yeah, right. And then I went back to Washington with the children and looked up um, a therapist, because we were new to the town, didn't know anybody, just opened the yellow book to any place, called this therapist, and I said, my husband's a creep. I'm getting. I'm leaving him. I've had it, and um, but I, I want to come to you first so that it looks good in the court. Uh. And in two seconds, she said, "Just from your story, it sounds like you two need to stop drinking, and then you can come and see me." And I said, "No, that isn't the problem. It's just my husband's just a creep." And so that's the whole point yeah. here too, Mac. Is that I mean, in spite of all the crazy making that went on in our life. It never occurred to me that I was an alcoholic. I mean, I here's the way I rationalize. I worked hard. Yeah. And I played hard. Yeah. You know, we just enjoyed partying. Yeah. That's what I'd convinced myself. And uh, alcohol is a crazy disease. It's uh, uh, cunning, powerful, and baffling. Yeah. And, um, and again, we all of our friends, everyone we ran around, you attract yeah. what you are. And so we attracted alcoholics, and we lived on a lake, and everybody we ran with always yeah. had, had drank we were not attracted to people that didn't drink so what happened now is was he a creep when he wasn't drunk no he was really cool okay but, <laughs> but i but you know when you're mad at somebody it all just goes into the same pot i know i know i know you forget about the nice part so i lived that life for several years and there's some crazy stories around that too but whenever lila was gone i would drink and i'd go to the bars and uh, i'd like to shoot a little pool and and uh, drink uh, a few drinks and uh, so i uh, she was gone uh, back to we were out in spokane washington and uh, she had gone back to visit her family i went to the bar uh, that night and uh, once again my luck was just really bad i forgot <laughs> to turn my headlights on now, and know that when jim says these <laughs> things he's sarcastic he takes full responsibility for his I actions do indeed but back then i didn't I guarantee you back then it was just if I had turned my headlights on, yeah. I wouldn't have been stopped and I wouldn't have gotten an OWI. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I, I did get an OWI that night and I had to level with uh, Lila when she got back that um, I'd, quote, fallen off the wagon. Now, I'd been drinking for a year, year and a half, unbeknownst to her. And so we Do went to Do you remember a, that when he told you? No, he didn't tell me. He, that's no, all I, in his head. Yeah, yeah. You did, you did not admit to me at that point. No, no, no. I didn't tell her that I'd been drinking that whole time. I just told her I fell, fell off, off the, the wagon no. that night. Well, no. I had to because I got no WI. I know, but, um, well, that isn't how I remember it. The okay. only time I remember even remotely knowing that you were drinking was when I was at the lake and got the letter from you. Well, him. you had to know the other time because that was no WI. And so we, you got to know, you know was, did they count this as number two? Uh, ye, well, what happened is I got a good lawyer and he got it pleaded down to reckless driving. Okay. So technically, Mac, it was, really wasn't even yeah. an OWI. It yeah. was just. I um, just remembered this story. You told me that it was an OWI from when we used to drink and they just got to it. Oh, could have been. I was Sounds quite, like a good good was, line to me. I was quite a liar back then, yeah. as it turns out. That's part of the disease. Yeah, it is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we had uh, Dick and Jane in yesterday, and um, we talked about that, and, and I did my best to help the audience understand that when you're dealing with an alcoholic and they're lying to you, please don't take it personally. No. It is a character defect of the disease. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 
So anyway, she did buy into that, but she did re- write me a letter at that time, pretty dramatic, and said that if, if I ever, um, uh, if I ever fell off the wagon or if I ever got drunk again, that she was going to leave me. And this was in writing this time, so I knew wow. she was serious. And um, uh, so I did. I really tried, and I really thought all this time that I just didn't have very good willpower. I'd seen her quit just based on willpower. And, and uh, when you quit, did you really quit? Yes. You I didn't really, cheat? I didn't cheat at all, but it, it but you wasn't were white knuckling, right? Oh, yeah. You weren't going to any step meetings. You weren't going no. to any of this. But it, it was total anger. Yeah. Okay. It, it wasn't willpower. It was anger, seething anger that I'm going to show him that one of us, we need to grow up and we need to take responsibility for the children. But not a good place to come into sobriety. Yeah. You had mounting resentments. Total. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So time went on, and I was able to string together maybe, like I said, 30 to 60 days, but I could never put more than that together. I continued to uh, drink, sneak drink, and whenever I was away, I would uh, continue to drink. And so, But at home, you wouldn't? No, no. no. I'd act okay. like, and, and uh, i just act like I had never been drinking, you know. Okay. Uh, but whenever I was away, I drank. But didn't that tell you you could quit? Well, I, if you could turn it on and off. No, because my job allowed me to travel every other week. So I, oh, I wasn't an, a daily okay. drinker. So that's the thing about alcoholism that I didn't understand at that time either is that I thought you had to be physically addicted to alcohol to be an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. You don't. You just have to have an obsession with the disease, with the alcohol. And I certainly had an obsession. I uh, wanted to drink uh, because it gave me the ease that I didn't have uh when i wasn't drinking so you abused alcohol you, you your body was not dependent on it but you well, abused i didn't it. drink normally i mean i never drank normally from right. the time i was 15 when i went to broadlands hospital to the time i was uh, 40 uh 142 when i actually uh quit drinking it was one more time it took um and uh lila again and i were separated uh, she was trying to sell a home over in omaha I was uh, actually was up Spirit Lake, I think. I was uh, back working in Des Moines. Were you separated physically or maritally? No, just physically. physically she okay. happened to be away. Okay. And so whenever she was away, then I would go out and play. Okay. And uh, so I remember going to um, uh, Windsor Heights, and there was some little bar there that you could play pool toads or whatever it's frogs. Not there. Frogs. It was <laughs> not there anymore. No, it was called Frogs. It's where the new high V is. <laughs> okay. And uh, went to Frogs and uh, played pool. I was a pretty good pool uh, shooter, either drunk or sober. Won a lot of drinks that night, drank a lot that night, was leaving around uh, uh, 1 or 2 o'clock to go home. And uh, But, uh, you know, it's Windsor Heights. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so It's those Windsor Heights cops. It is. What's and it mean? once again, I forgot to turn my lights on. If I'd turned my headlights on and I hadn't been in Windsor Heights, I wouldn't have got the, uh, wouldn't have got stopped. I wouldn't have got my fourth arrest for mm-hmm. OWI. Mm-hmm. That's the way I thought. Mm-hmm. The next morning, I still thought that. I had to call uh, Lila's brother. He bailed me up that uh, out that night. I was just angry because I just knew this cop had ruined my life. Not me. Right. You know, I didn't believe I had anything to do with it. Again, it was just bad luck. If I'd turned on my headlights, if I hadn't been in Windsor Heights, I wouldn't have had a problem. But now my wife had given me a letter that said that she was going to leave me. So, oh, now I'm in big trouble. I called my lawyer. I said, maybe I won't tell my wife. He said, Jim, he said, are you insane? Of course you're going to have to tell your wife. You're going to lose your license, you know, even though they don't know it, that you've been arrested four times for OWI. Uh, they asked me that uh, how many times I'd been arrested for OWI, and I told them this was my first uh, again after the fourth time being arrested. And they did find out that lie. They uh, found out that in Waterloo that I had been charged and given a deferred sentence. I thought, oh, I thought you meant that it was still on my record. Yeah, I thought that right. was good. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. Some yeah, lies. Baloney stuff. So anyway, I did write my wife. I, I called my lawyer. And this is a guy that I knew very well from Waterloo, Iowa. I really chose him because he was a social friend, and he drank just as much as I did. And he said, Jimmy, I think you need to go to a 12-step meeting. And uh, I was just indignant. I was just angry. I thought, you're not listening to me. I I was in water. I was in uh, Windsor Heights. (laughs) You know, I didn't turn on my headlights. He said, no, I really think you need to go to a 12-step meeting. And 
I thought, oh, I get it. It's going to look good to the judge yeah. if I go to that 12-step meeting. Yeah. See, I thought it was he was giving me a, a legal maneuver. Sure. No, wink, uh, wink. Yeah. At this point, he's knowing, Jim, you're an alcoholic, you know? you, you got a problem. But I still didn't recognize it. And uh, I uh, called a friend of mine that I knew who had been through treatment in the past and uh, it had worked to various degrees of success for him in the past. And I called him and he told me that there was a meeting down on uh, 28th and, um, and University. And uh, so I, I went down there after work and it was at 5.30 and uh, went up and I was just embarrassed to have been there. And there were two guys standing on the side porch there. And I, and I kind of whispered, I said, is this Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> you know, I was just so embarrassed to be there. And, and they said, well, yeah, come on down, man. This is, uh, you got the right place. And we went down this dingy little basement. That that's what I thought at that time. I love the place now. But um, back then, I thought, my heavens, they're taking me down to some little dungeon. I didn't know what to expect. But when we walked in, we saw a whole circle of people sitting around in dilapidated chairs and couches and they were all laughing is this the drake meeting yeah the drake meeting. that's that was my first meeting too and i remember the very same thing <laughs> what a crummy place old yeah. couches and oh, chairs and, down and they stuff. were smoking back oh, then yeah, sure i remember that and uh it I, smells I just, horrible down there. Yeah. my first thought was what are you people laughing about i mean don't you understand you're at a 12-step meeting for heaven's sakes you're a bunch of alcoholics, and you're sitting around here laughing and stuff. Your life should be over. Yeah. Well, that's the beginning of uh, how it works. And uh, when we come back, we'll hear more from Jim and Lila. It's Recovery Monday live here on 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com. I'm Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am Administrative Manager. I am the Senior Technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to the Monday edition.
edition of View from a Pew. We call it Recovery Monday with your host, Jay Michael McCoy. 22 before the top, uh, SRN, Salem Radio Network News at 4, and then at 4.03, it's True Blue starring Michael Mudloff. That'll be coming up this afternoon live here on 99.3 KTIA. Thank you for joining us today on this sixth day of May. Lila and Jim Stafford are in as we kick off our Recovery Monday shows uh, telling his story. And so you just got your fourth OWI. It's not your fault. Your wife had written you a letter that said, if you you drink again, I'm going to leave you. She's in Omaha, right? Do something dramatic. She was up at Spirit Lake, uh, just uh, vacationing up there, and uh, so I had to do something dramatic. And I figured uh, I'd take the advice of my uh, my lawyer and go to a twelve step meeting, and that would show her that I genuinely want. And I I need to admit at this point that I had no interest in quitting drinking. Right. I needed to do something to get the heat off. I needed to do something that Lila would find, uh, you know, appealing that uh, she might believe that I really wanted to quit. And meanwhile, you've been sober how long at this point? I thought it was four years, but he tells me, I think maybe it was three. Yeah. Okay. But, but and you had been, been white knuckling it. You hadn't been going to 12 step meetings. You had not gone through recovery, rehab, anything. No, I wasn't white knuckling. I really didn't want to drink, but I was going insane because I had n- no way of dealing with problems. I didn't know how to deal with problems, right. so it, that started adding up and felt like I was going insane. So uh, I went to that first meeting, and uh, again, I used to chalk everything up to luck. Today, I believe in divine intervention. Today, I believe in um, a God. Uh, at that time, I had no uh, belief in really a higher power or a God. I, I gone to church but uh, i just did that for looks yeah and uh um really didn't have any conscious contact with a higher power so at that point i just um i uh, went to my first meeting and as luck would have it there was a guy that i'd gone to high school with that was at that 12-step meeting he uh, after the meeting had told me he'd been sober for seven years wow. i couldn't even fathom you know matter of fact my question to him was I don't know how you do it for seven weeks. I've not been able to string time together for seven weeks. I said, what do you do on, you know, things like 4th of July or New Mm. Year's Eve, which was going to be coming up, Mm. all the events. uh, I'm really thinking to myself, what do you do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. You know, because I just didn't know how to uh, not drink for any period of time. When I say period of time, that usually was a weekend. If I went by a weekend without drinking, that was uh, an unusual situation. So uh, he said, just keep coming back. Uh, he gave me a, uh, a text that we use in our 12-step uh, meeting, and I read the first 164 pages of that text, and um, I identified with a lot of the things in there. And um, But um, uh, I had an opportunity then to go to uh, an outpatient treatment center because when I went to uh, through the court system, they gave me the opportunity of pleading guilty and um, paying a $500 fine. And uh, I can't remember if there was any jail time. Again, that was 23 years ago. So they weren't quite as rigorous as they are today. Uh, today, if you're, uh, I think you go to jail the first time, you certainly you do. go to jail the second time. Yeah, You and, go to jail for two days the first time and you lose your license for 30 days during yeah. that time. Yeah. And then on the second one, because I've had two, uh-huh. on the second one, you uh, go to jail for uh, a weekend, a long weekend, but yeah. you also have to go to two weekends out at uh, Fort Des Moines. Fort Des Moines. Yeah. And I lost my license for a year. Yeah. And there's no, there's no work permits. There's no, there's nothing. You're done. Yeah. But Jim, then you, you forgot to tell that you, when you got picked up and you went to that meeting, then you wrote me a, yeah, a letter and sent a FedEx Package. letter to me up at the lake and told her that i had gone to this 12-step meeting that i really wanted to get sober and uh, my hope was that she'd take mercy on me thank heavens her father's a physician he was up there at the lakes with her at that time and said he's sick and luckily i went through a, a, a treatment center that believes that alcohol is a disease because it, it truly is it's a progressive disease and um Not all treatment centers believe that. I believe that that's an important component uh, to getting sober. But I just want to say, from my point of view, I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I thought you were having an affair because you were just acting weird. 
and <laughs> um, and so I saw this FedEx truck coming in the driveway, and we live on the lake. We live so far away. FedEx trucks don't come our way, and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, this is a letter. I said to my sister, this is a letter from Jim asking for a divorce. Mm. So, boy, I'm, you were a paranoid woman. <laughs> well, I was in tune with something. I just didn't That's know what true. it was. That's true. You were. Yeah. And so I, um, the guy starts up the driveway and I'm crying thinking he's going to ask for a divorce because he's having an affair or else he's just going to tell me about this affair. So the whole time I'm reading this letter, I'm thinking he's having an affair. So it took me a while to read it several times before I saw that he was, um, he had been in trouble. Yeah, did you, she, in that letter, did you tell her you had your an, another OWI? I did. Okay. I had to admit that. So this is the fourth time and that I've I been might arrested. also add, my father was literally dying at the time of cancer. And on his deathbed, he said, don't leave this man. He's he's sick. So then I thought, oh, now <laughs> I've, I've got to stay with him because my father. this is my father's <laughs> last wish. And I'm mad about that. So it, but that was a God thing, too. Yeah. yeah. You know? She hung in there. Um, I went through... Uh, outpatient uh, treatment um it was a, a five-week program uh, during the evenings uh, she got to uh, celebrate uh, i guess her 40th birthday oh god that was horrible uh, in outpatient that was uh, not a pleasant situation mm. and um but um then afterwards uh, they told me uh in uh, after getting out of treatment to uh, keep it simple well i misunderstood that <coughs> i thought they meant keep it easy on yourself you know just don't um exert yourself too too much so i just started going to 12-step meetings whenever it was convenient mm. and uh wasn't very rigorous about going i went uh, whenever it was convenient for me uh and continued to stay sober uh for the first time in my life for long periods of time when i talk about long periods i'm talking 30 60 90 days uh, i got up to six months and uh but i still wasn't really working the 12 steps mm -hmm. Uh, of this recovery program. I, I just went to meetings. Uh, I uh, uh, would say the Lord's Prayer afterwards, and we'd break, and I'd be gone. And uh, whenever it was convenient, I'd go to a meeting or whenever I... What I found is by just going to meetings initially and sharing honestly about my desire to drink, because, see, I'd never been able to tell Lila that I felt like drinking or never been able to really tell anybody that, gosh, I have this over powering uh need to to have a drink i just kept have that. nine drinks yeah oh absolutely yeah that's a good point mac because i never had one drink never wanted one drink. right i i i wanted to get well, you would have one drink but it would be um, well no that's when, when you were counting i would get one 64 inch ounce tumbler <laughs> see i only had one drink yeah, yeah. and it's a half a liter of gin <laughs> yes. yeah, exactly so um i don't know i uh I was able to string together six months, but I was going strike raving mad at that point and uh, really wanted to drink, um, had an overwhelming compulsion to drink, thought about drinking all the time, and uh, finally decided to do something that was very difficult for me, and that I don't know why now I look back on it, I guess um, just fear, uh, asking another person for help. Yeah, get a sponsor. Yeah, so I asked for sponsorship and... Uh, that change things. Yeah. And sponsors do change things, don't they? Yeah, yes, they but the codependent I was, he asked the wrong sponsor <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. Because I I saw this guy, as, Jim's a businessman. This guy was, to me, like um, a guy without a job, kind of, um, he wasn't a businessman. He, he was a part-time uh, security guard. Okay, so I didn't see why how this man could help him. I knew right. nothing about any twelve steps or any of that. I just and all you I weren't going to twelve step no. meetings yet. No, and I saw this man as somebody that was going to ruin our marriage and ruin Jim because how could this guy show him anything? Because at that time, everything in my life was about outward appearance, and if you didn't have you know millions of dollars, then um, you had nothing to show us. But see, Lila was under the misimpression like myself we'll talk about it in a minute yeah we'll, we'll finish this in a minute we'll wrap this up and and uh, uh tell you uh if you have questions or you'd like to talk to either one of these folks off air uh just call father tattoo at 1-855-244-0077 leave your number and we'll talk to you next on ktia from the remax real estate concept studios this is webcast one live 
If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for Him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. The only way we come to know the saviorship of Jesus Christ is by bowing and acknowledging that he is Lord and King over all the earth. Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and by repenting of our sin and accepting him by faith, what he did for us, we are forgiven. Salvation is not a combination of faith and works. Salvation is by faith alone in God. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to the Monday edition of The View from a Pew. It's called The Recovery Monday with your host, J. Michael McCoy. Thanks, Father Tattoo. 10 before the top, uh, Salem Radio Network News at 4, and then 4.03, Michael Mudloff with, um, um, what's it called again? I always forget. Recovery Monday. No, no that's he's a uh, <laughs> true blue. True blue. Thank you. There you go. Why don't I remember that? Uh, yeah, we're Recovery Monday, but the next show is okay. True Blue. Pa- Pastor Michael Mudloff. All right, so you're, you're in the 12-step program, and you finally get a sponsor. This is 24 years ago. It is, and uh, that changed everything because sponsors, uh, uh, sponsorship held me accountable, and it uh, helped me work through the 12 steps of this recovery program. Had it not been for that, uh, I might have just continued to try to go to meetings to stay sober. But that's my experience is that people – will not likely stay sober by just going to meetings. They have to try to practice the 12 steps of the program in all their affairs. By doing that, they're going to have a spiritual experience. That's just the way it is. And uh, that was my experience. And and the most important thing for me is that um, that first six months I wanted to drink or I thought about drinking every day. Mm -hmm. After working uh, the fourth step uh, and the fifth step, of uh, this 12-step recovery program, that was uh, lifted for me. That desire to drink on a daily basis was absolutely uh, eliminated. And is that a God thing? I think absolutely. Or a higher power thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because if you, if, you, if you have this disease, which we have, uh, some people like to say we're allergic to alcohol. I don't care either way. Just understand we can't drink. Yeah. Um, but then we do. We have this experience, which all of a sudden, it doesn't really matter anymore. I had um, what I call a, a, a spiritual awakening. It wasn't a spiritual experience in a, in a quick moment. But over time, I uh, awoke to spiritual uh, understandings that uh, I never had before. As I told you, I never believed in God. Today, I believe in God. Uh, That came about as part of the 12-step program. So during this time, how is your husband changing? Miraculous? Uh, It, I would say it took a few years. Okay. And, um, but he was much more at peace with himself, with the, with the sponsor. So how did he get you? Did he get you into 12 steps then? No, I, he was in treatment and I went as a concerned person. And I remember the counselor I had at the time saying, um, what happens to you when you, when you go out partying? And I said, well, before I quit drinking, I would just have to look in the, or she said, what would happen to you if you went to a party right now? And I said, well, I just have to look in the mirror 
and say three times, um, you, you can only have three drinks. You can only have three drinks. You can only have three drinks. And then I was okay. And, and I remember at the time they said, do you think normal people have to say that? Because mm-hmm. I would not, at that point, I would not say I was an alcoholic. I just had a drinking problem. There was something about the word, I'm an alcoholic, that word just carried a thousand pound weight with it. And mm-hmm. I, and a lot of bad connotations. Those were dirty old men throwing up in gutters right. that were alcoholics. And, you know, I'd passed out in bushes, but I wasn't in gutters. Right. And, with brown paper you know, bags. just things that, yeah, things that we tell ourselves. Anyway, um, and then I was seeing a counselor and she said to me, I can't see you anymore unless you start going to a 12 step program. Mm. Because she said, you have so many problems, you need some help. And not just with me, with, but with a sponsor and some other people. So she, she pretty much pushed me in the doors. And then I, then I wanted to say, no, I'm better than that. I came from a good family. I'm educated. I'm not really like those people. And she told me what meeting to go to. And I walked in. I knew everybody in there. Wow. So that was an eye opener. It was like, wow. oh, why, why didn't these people tell me they were here? <laughs> so, and then she had to push me into getting a sponsor because that was, I just don't like to ask people to help me with things. And um, pretty soon ended up with a sponsor and started doing the 12 steps. How many people have you sponsored? Oh, over the years, I, a lot. I, I, I would say eight to 10 at a time. Okay. Over. I've been sober 27 years. How many have you sponsored, Jim? I probably have sponsored uh, between 100 and 200 men. Um, today, I currently sponsor uh, a dozen men. And, uh, you know, people either move away or they don't get it. And see, I can't keep them sober. Right. Um, yeah. And, right. Uh, it's not all your I job. can do is share what was shared with me and what worked for me. And that was to try to practice the 12 steps and, um, uh, try to be of service. The thing that I remember that surprised me so is I thought I had this vision in my mind that the reason that a 12-step program was there, that when you fell off the wagon, you could call all these people and they'd come help you. And I remember in one of my first meetings when I realized that the opposite is true. You call before, we're there for you. You call after, don't call. Yeah, We're, 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 not, you know, we're not dealing with somebody who's drinking again. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Well, it's been it's been miraculous. Everything that's good in my life today, I owe to the twelve step program, and uh, I'm just uh, grateful that I've got Lila in my life and that we're on the same path. Uh, I believe that um, our relationship has improved dramatically. Well, I know it has. Um, we and speak if ha- the same language, and yeah, that, we that is be really important. Yes. We would not be together. Well, and you'd so prob- you'd probably be dead. I would be yeah. either dead or in jail. Yeah. Because today they put you in prison. Right. Um, I mean, if you get arrested four times for OWI, you, you go to prison. Yeah, right, yeah. Especially today. Well, well, I don't remember the name, and it doesn't matter the name, but the guy from Ankeny. Yeah. Uh, and I, he's in prison now, or he's dead, one or the yeah. other. I can't think. And I've, I've known people that um, uh, have, under a blackout situation, have uh, been in accidents and killed people. Yeah. And uh, I could have been there. Um, I was in blackout many, many times when I drank. I was arrested, as I said, four times for OWI, but it was hundreds and hundreds of times that I drank under the influence. And we influence. used to laugh about that. When we were both oh drinking, God. and you know, you had a little shame for a while, but then we could make jokes about that. Driving and, down the wrong way. Oh, yeah, we've been on the interstate the wrong way. We've ended up in parks and woken up. We didn't know where we were. Well, OWIs were badges of honor. When yeah. you're a drinker. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you yeah. haven't got yeah. one yet? Well, you will. Yeah. You will. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much for coming in and, and sharing that story. I appreciate that. And just know that there are people out there who are willing to, to share their story with you. And I hope what you heard today, well, I, I don't hope you heard this, but if for some reason you're caught up in alcoholism, or maybe it's just a couple glasses of wine every night, or just whatever it is, I think you probably heard something that kind of made you look at yourself a little bit today. Uh, I like Lila's line. That's a good one. If you have to say, I'm only going to drink this much, that's probably a good sign there's an issue there. So if you would need any help or know anybody that does, uh, I've got this friend. Uh, Maybe it's a son. Maybe it's a daughter. Maybe it's a grandson. Maybe it's a brother. Maybe it's a sister. Maybe it's your mom or dad. Uh, But for heaven's sakes, uh, make sure that you get a hold of us and we'll be more than happy to show up and uh, suit up and help you and that person any way we can. 
So until tomorrow uh, at three o'clock for the view from a pew, I'm J. Michael McCoy. And if I haven't told you this lately, thanks for listening. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you. Uh, coming up uh, later on in the program, don't forget Reich Playputs uh, is taking over the radio show on Wednesdays and Thursdays. He loves gospel music. And so he's always got some uh, gospel singers on the line, some in the studio to sing along, uh, some on the phone to interview. But it's nice to have Reich around. He's a great guy. He's a good Christian guy. And he'll entertain you uh, as much as he can on uh, this Wednesday and Thursday. And I'll see you back on Friday with Pastor Davey Bloom. Right here on 99.3 KTIA, powered by webcast1live.com.